everyone, and thank you for coming. So we will get started on this session on carbon border adjustment mechanisms in the European Union. So uh, if you had asked probably the three of us five years ago, well, first of all, carbon tax uh, adjustment mechanisms tax imports their um, carbon content at the border, okay? Just in case you don't know what they are. So if you had asked any of the three of us five years ago if you could tax carbon content at the border, we would have all agreed, I think, that it's theoretically great and that it's a no, a no starter that will never happen. So five years later, just October 1st of this year, the EU launched its carbon border adjustment mechanism and it's already in action. So things have changed quite a bit in the last uh, few years when it comes to this type of policies that, again, not too long ago seemed very good from a first, second, third best perspective, but just not feasible. So today we have two experts in carbon border adjustment uh, mechanisms. One, I would say, uh, will be presenting um, a more academic paper, that will be Morton Olsen, who has a very interesting paper on how to build a practical carbon border adjustment that will work as well as possible. As you will see, carbon border adjustments are interesting from a theoretical perspective, but they are far from, from perfect. So Morton will give us uh, his paper on that topic. Later, we will get a more practical, practical perspective on how to do uh, CPAMs by Luis Garicano, who, uh, apart from being a wonderful economist, was directly involved in the legislation process of the carbon border adjustment in the European Union as a EU parliamentarist. So this is kind of the goal of the session. Each of them will have their presentations, and at the end, I hope that we can open it up uh, for questions. I think we are uh, few enough of us in the room that if some of you have a very urgent clarifying question, we might also allow for that. Let's see how that goes. Uh, if it goes out of hands, we'll keep the questions for the end. So thank you, Morten and Luis, for being here. I'm very excited, and I look forward to your presentations. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for having me. It's not. It's not often that uh, you sort of write a theoretical paper on how to do these things, and then you end up sitting next to the guy who literally wrote the legislation on these things. So, uh, as Mar said, I'm going to present sort of a simple framework for how to think about these things. Uh, I'm going to base that on a paper of mine that I wrote with Steve Sikala and uh, David Mus. Uh, I am going to relate it a little bit to the European design of the carbon border adjustment. But like, given that Luis is here, I'm going to let all the inside information uh, come from him and give some of the publicly available uh, information. Now, so here's the basic problem. In the EU, we already have uh, a carbon uh, emission system inside, the EU ETS, which prices carbon at something like 80 to uh, 100 euros. The coverage of that in terms of industries is going to go up, and the number of quotas for this system is going to go down over the coming years. So that's a system we already have in place for production in the EU. Now, there's an obvious problem here, which is that the EU doesn't have jurisdiction over producers in the rest of the world. So we have an obvious leakage problem. The production could just move to the EU. To some extent, the EU ETS system has tried to um, alleviate that by giving free carbon credits to some of the producers in the EU, but that's not uh, a sustainable nor particularly elegant solution to the problem. So uh, one particular thing that one can try to do to alleviate this is have a carbon border adjustment. That is a tax for importing stuff into the EU, either paid by the EU importer or paid by the exporter. Now, one can imagine doing it in this way. So I could tell an exporter that you could certify how much, what the emission content of your production is. Let's for the moment just set aside. You can do that, and then I can tax you according to the embedded carbon in what you're producing. Or I could then, and I could then say, for those who don't do it, I could have some other number that they are uh, paying to it. So then the obvious question is, how should you design such a system? I think a neat way of thinking about this is thinking about three different systems. So there's sort of like the baseline, the one where we don't have a carbon border adjustment. And then there's a uniform carbon border adjustment at, say, the industry or the industry country level. So we can say, if you import steel, that is this price uh, per ton, or maybe even more uh, specific, it could be steel production from Turkey, then it's this price. 
Now, uh, that is a nice starting point. It has two obvious problems. So one is typically in a lot of these products, there's enormous heterogeneity in emissions in different products. So take steel, for instance. It can either be produced with a blast furnace or an electric arc furnace. They have very different emission content, and there's a lot of heterogeneity in here. So you're not capturing that if you just have a commodity-specific tax. The other one is you don't incentivize abatement. So you don't incentivize that the producers actually invest in doing something to lower the emissions for their products, because if they're just taxed at the industry level, they don't have an incentive to do anything about that. Now, a third possibility, and that is basically what the EU uh, CBAM system does, is that we could say uh, have an individual tax on you as a particular producer. Now, obviously, that's going to be more costly to administer, and that's going to be a lot of the practical impl implementation of how you do this. It is going to address heterogeneity, and it's going to incur in, in, in abatement. There's a complementarity between these two. Uh, if you tax individually, there's going to be abatement. There are the obvious questions of what industries should be covered and how sh what should we do about firms that don't certify. Either do we not allow that or do we tax them at a different level. Now, importantly for this, what this system does is that it basically extends the jurisdiction of the European Union to producers abroad who export to the EU. But unfortunately, there are sort of non-trivial general equilibrium effects here or equilibrium effects in that you're then tampering with prices and emissions abroad because you still don't have jurisdiction in the whole country, in the whole world. So I'm going to lay out a few of those two. So here's going to be my basic insight. This is going to be a basic setup. This is going to be the most theoretically complicated slide um, in this presentation. So imagine one industry and let it be some standardized thing, so some commodity, homogeneous. They're going to be home producers, that's in the EU, and they're going to be foreign producers, say in Turkey or Brazil or something. And the home producers are going to have some distribution of emissions per unit produced. And let's just say that the EU ETS system taxes that in a Peruvian matter right now, so they're correctly taxed. Then we're going to have foreign producers, and they're going to have some emissions level as well. So then a, suppose, a, a um, suggestion that we have in, in our paper is let's give them the following option. They can verify their emissions. That's going to have two costs. So there's going to be the actual cost, sort of administrative cost, certification cost, and so on. That's capital F. And then potentially you could choose to either subsidize that by having a little f that's negative or to tax it by having a little f that's positive. If you do that, then you're taxed at little tau times your individual emission rate, because now I know that. So I can tax your individual emission rate per unit produced times some tax rate that we could then set Peruvian if you want to. The foreign exporters can also choose not to verify and therefore uh, not export to the EU or not to verify. And then depending on what the EU system sets up, they could be taxed at the uh, value of T, which is then a choice value. In such a simple setup, you're basically going to have a cutoff, low emission firms will certify because they will be taxed at a lower level and high emission firms will not certify. So you're going to have a system that looks like this. So these here are the foreign producers. The blue ones pay the cost and get certified and the rest ones don't pay the cost. Now the important thing here is that the cutoff here is a policy choice. So it's a policy choice either because you can either tax or subsidize it. That's what we call little f. More generally, you could also make it more or less cumbersome to do this certification. It's also a policy choice in that whether firms will choose to certify or not also depend on how do I treat firms who haven't certified this low T, which is going to be the same on all of them uh, here. Now, uh, an important insight here is that you learn something from the fact that a firm has not certified. So it's a whole set of firms. They have the whole distribution up here. Some of them certify. Then the ones that don't certify, I now know or at least off this cutoff. So there's information to be learned from the fact that a firm does not certify, and it should be taxed accordingly higher. I now know that it has a higher emission level. Let's do the following comparison. So let's compare two different policies, either the uniform carbon border adjustment, so that's at the industry level. I'm going to tax everyone the same. There's going to be no certification or things like that or an individual uh, system, and let's consider sort of what I would think of as the baseline. So I'm going to have Peruvian taxes on those that certify. That's going to be they pay the EU quota price. I'm neither going to subsidize nor tax the certification, little f equal to zero. 
and then I'm gonna tax the ones that don't certify with a T that's also gonna be Pigouvian, but takes into account the fact that I know these have a higher emission level. So let's compare those two settings. Now, the clear, as I said before, advantages of an individual uh, CFAM is taxation is more efficient and there's an incentive to abate, but there are also disadvantages. The obvious one are the administrative costs, but there are also more subtle costs to this. One we call uh, two equilibrium effects. One we call the backfilling effect, which is basically that if you allow the cleanest producers from foreign to certify and export to the EU, you're leaving the dirtiest one at home. They're not gonna stop producing. This is where it's important that we don't have jurisdiction over the whole world. So you can even have it bad enough that you pull out a half the competition from the cleanest one, and then you leave the dirtiest one in the foreign country to uh, continue to uh, emit. So that we call that uh, a backfilling effect. There's also potentially a consumption leakage effect in that if equilibrium prices here lead to lower prices abroad, then you encourage consumption of say steel abroad, which also has a negative effect because that's not taxed it's, and therefore aren't over uh, consumed. And we show in a sort of a little example, back of envelope calculation, that for if we consider a system like this for the OECD importing steel from Brazil, then a basic system like this of Pigubian taxes and no tax or, or subsidy, you actually end up with lower welfare from an individual uh, CFAM than from the common CFAM. You, you can obviously, if you know everything, you can obviously design it so it's welfare improving compared to the uniform one. We show that that actually requires a tax on certification and a lower tax on those that don't certify, basically to encourage them to at least export some of it to the EU to avoid the, the backfilling effect. Let me briefly talk about the EU CBAM and then we're gonna let uh, Luis uh, take uh, over here. So the EU CBAM is in a several stage uh, rocket here. It has a trial here that runs from now until the end of 25. Um, and it only covers some industries. It covers cement, iron, steel, alu aluminum, fertilizers, and electricity. Note that these are sort of relatively standardized commodities, which is a feature that I like of the current system. I believe that that's gonna be easier to check. From 2000, so during this trial period, it's a trial period, there will be no taxes. From then on, from 2026 on, you will have to pay the quota system equivalent price in the EU for importing stuff uh, from abroad. Note that there's a nice little touch to this, which is that if the foreign country has a climate policy of itself, then there's a rebate for that. So we encourage foreign countries to implement systems like this themselves. It's sort of a Nordhaus climate club type of thing where I punish for not uh, implementing uh, these things. As far as I can see, there's no export rebate here. So if you produce in the EU and then you export abroad, you still have to pay the EU, uh, the, um, the CO2 tax that we have here. Uh, let me just briefly, I don't know if you can actually see this, I'm now realizing. Uh, this is a list of the different uh, exporters to the EU. This is 2015 to 2019. So Russia is bigger here than it probably would be today. And these are the different groups. So you can sort of see Russia and China and the United Kingdom are some of the countries that will be most heavily affected by this. Obviously, even though this is um, less than 20% of their exports, these are particularly dirty industries. Um, let me skip this and let you get to this. Uh, so let me, let me wrap up my, my introduction here, where, whether this will work in practice, and I expect that that's where we're gonna take the rest of the uh, conversation. So I think this is a good start. It focuses on relatively simple thing, sort of commodities, big plants that you have a potential of actually checking how what their emissions rates are. It's relatively emission intensive goods. And it has a nice trial period where we can learn a lot from this. I think it still remains unclear how burdensome and expensive this is gonna be for exporters abroad and for European importers. And in particular, how are we gonna check whether what they do whether what they claim their emissions level are is in fact their emissions level. So the EU has done a lot of homework here. There's like 500 pages of documentation on the internet. PricewaterhouseCoopers would gladly help you fill out these documents and so on. But it remains a little unclear to me how the EU will actually check that these documents reflect what the actual emissions in a steel plant in, um, 
in, uh, in China might be. There are other issues uh, about whether this um, is in compliance with the WTO as well, uh, which is a little unclear, but I think it's the EU has paid a lot of attention to making sure that this does comply with the, uh, with the WTO. So I think I'm going to let that be my opening remarks, and then, uh, yes. Yes, I mean, if you are curious about some of these questions, they line up very much with my follow-up questions. So we might get to hear some of those, some of those answers. Um, oh, and can we just keep on? Okay. Uh, Thank you, Morten. Uh, thanks, Mark, for inviting me. Thanks, Vetsus, for uh, organizing this, and uh, uh, congratulations to CPR on a wonderful anniversary. Uh, so, indeed, I come on this from the very policy side. I would say, even from the politics side, I was I was uh, doing the initial initiative report for CBAM when the Parliament started, and I negotiated also the, the the work program of the Commission before they started. So, I was I was kind of involved at the at the creation of this. Um, and and uh, that's that's how I that's how I got into these into these questions. Um, let me just start with the politics, okay, and then I go to the implementation and how it was designed. So the interesting thing politically about this type of of uh, of, of program of uh, uh, border adjustment mechanism, we call it mechanism, not tax notice. Uh, this is important, as you will see. Um, is that all from the start, we started when we did the, the work program in the summer of 2019, we met two people from each group, I was in the center group Renew Europe, and, and basically it was surprising we put this on the table and every group says like, oh yeah, great, the unions, the employers, the liberals, the greens, the socialists, the popular party, which was the, yeah, that comma should have been, and, and why, the political logic given the ETS is overwhelming, right, is climate logic, as we will see very clear, and as Morton said, there's industrial policy logic, which people are not blind to. They want to protect jobs and so on. Uh, there is the labor, the firms, uh, the, the unions like it, the firms like it. Basically, it's, it's, it's all around something that, that people like because, well, you know, to some extent trade virus, although I will, I, I will argue this is not one, but to some extent it is, um, are always politically popular with, with, with those constituents. Um, so it eventually passed. Um, as the result of a, of a grand uh, bargain, like always in Europe. Basically, the trade-off here is that what, what we are paying and what we're receiving is the Germans, grand bargains are always German-French, okay? That's what grand means in Eurospeak. Um, I don't know if this is, but that's mostly the case. So uh, the Germans were very much after the extension of the ATS. We have a, a, a government that which, which is green and which wants basically the extension of the emission trading scheme, particularly to to households and to uh, transport. So they were very much uh, wanting the extension of the ETS. And the French, as always the French, sorry for the French in the room, they wanted barriers. So uh, the CBAM was something they were very much after. I was surprised, I must say, that the ETS too came in. It's not the same ETS, it's a separate system, but it does extend to building and road transport, which are two very political sensitive uh, places. The reason it, man it, it works is because it's not the houses who pay the ETS for their building fuel, it's the distributor of the building fuel, so the households are kind of shielded to some extent. Um, the um, uh, entry into force, uh, Morton said it already, so I will spend no, no time on this, is, is basically phased. There is this very early phase that started two months ago in which you, have to you are obliged to report, there's no payment uh, or adjustment there is no verification, no checking of what you're doing. There's only a penalty if you fail to fill up the paperwork. Um, and then we're going to review it, re-watch re the scope, and then decide again. That's the plan. Uh, so the scope, as I will tell you, is not, is not definitive. And then there's a fully operational uh, purpose, which has two uh, extra things, which is you have to buy the CPAM certificate, which I will describe in a second. And there is this independent verifier role. It's not us, indeed, as Morton said, there is no extraterritoriality, so we cannot just kind of go around inspecting everybody else, but when you surrender your certificate, you say, people that you see maybe, who knows, uh, check this, and, 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 and that's what we have to trust. Let's see how those, how those work. Um, so I will talk uh, about the design in terms of the aim, the scope, and the international assessment and international dimension which is, as, as, uh, that's what Morton left you with, 
that is the tricky part. The WTO, the US, the third countries, the developing countries, it's going to be complicated in that dimension. Um, um, the starting point, and the reason this is kind of politically popular, is that most of the world is not pricing carbon emissions. Um, as you see there, 70% of global carbon emissions are not priced. Uh, those are the places where it is priced. In, in green is the ETS, and in purple is the carbon, carbon tax. And emissions have been increasing. So basically, there is more and more production that is being uh, excluded uh, because it's the rest of the, of the world who's increasing those emissions. Um, not only is the carbon pricing the exception, but uh, this is JP, JP from, from uh, two American economists who um, I've, been, I've been working with, uh, Kimberly Clausing and uh, Catherine Wolfram, and they basically show, look, look, at the, look at the vertical axis, which is the carbon price. Everything that is over 50 is, is blue. It's us, except for Uruguay. Uh, but Uruguay has a very small share of national emissions. So basically, a place like China, where you do have carbon pricing, look at the level of the price, which is like 10, <laughs> and look at the share of emissions. So even in places where we have carbon pricing, the carbon pricing is very low. So that is the reason why this actually kind of is, 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 a, is a, a need to, to do something, and, and let me develop that. Now, why did Europe su succeed in this extremely tricky endeavor? And if you, you think about it without knowing how politics works in Europe, you think, oh, wow, we're much more enlightened. And in fact, it has to do with the way legislation and the treaties work. It's, it's more of a lucky fluke that we ended up with the best possible system rather than the result of foresight. Uh, Jacques Delors, the president of the commission who is responsible for everything from the monetary union to the single market, the one president of the commission we had to really push the thing forward, um, he wanted the carbon tax. The problem with taxes is that the EU, uh, in spite of all our illusions, works really like a international organization, like United Nations, more than any other thing, meaning we don't really have the power to tax. The taxing is done by the member states. They only relinquish it by unanimity. They have to all decide. So then Jacques Delors found that this was impossible. Um, so their proposal to take what the economists were defending, which we usually don't have a lot of success in these things, which was, hey, let's make an emission trading scheme. Um, this is an environmental legislation. This is not taxing, so it can pass by qualified majority. And so do the modification, the ATS2, and crucially, the CBAM. Okay, crucially, as you will see. So we have a system that is extremely large scale, 500, um, 500 million people, and very efficient and very big economies of scale. Um, you know everything about the ETAs. I don't need to tell you. It's the first carbon market. It has, oh, one, I want to tell you a couple of things that are going to be interesting for how we implement CBAM. The first one is it's installation based, 11,000 energy heavy using installations. It's the factory which gets to buy ETS. It's not the product. And that's going to be important when we're importing products that might come from multiple factories. It covers 40% of all US car, uh, carbon emissions. Um, there is a cap. Uh, that is set, as, as we would do in our models when we teach microeconomics, and we decrease that cap over time. And of course, efficiency dictates that the better use of the cap is, is used. And if this was covering 100%, we could tell people, look, forget about morality and forget about doing an effort yourself for the climate, and we could release people from this moral weight of being clean by just telling them, look, on the margin, you're paying for the social uh, cost, uh, for the social marginal social cost or your behavior, so it doesn't matter whether you buy clean or dirty, it's gonna be the same. But sadly, it doesn't cover 40%. But in that sense, I actually think it's politically not as bad as we claim sometimes. It's politically worse to be telling people you cannot get a mortgage in a house in Paris if you haven't isolated your windows because then people really tend, tend, uh, tend to uh, populist parties and so on. So uh, there is a second element, which is a market stability reserve which is that you buy a set of allowances. If the commission basically has two limits. If there's too many allowances in the market, it buys them. If it's too few, it releases them. So there's a, a range around 400 million um, tons. So the, the, the result of the cap and trade is there's a rising price. Uh, as, as the cap, this is on the left in red, is the cap going down. I have to, to, to do two things. If you see me that I don't pass, it's because I'm not synchronizing myself. Um, so the price has been increasing. Um, now, the problem is leakage. And the word leakage 
basically means I am going to produce the same aluminum that I was going to produce. I'm going to contaminate the planet the same as I was going to contaminate, but my plant is going to be in Morocco and I will import it from Morocco. That's kind of an extreme case to, to clarify what we're talking about. When is leakage going to be high? It's going to be high where we have high energy intensity and high trade intensity. So basically in this graph, the upper right corner, for example, aluminum, new spring meal, etc., which are, oh sorry, energy intensity is a bit cut, but let's say uh, very energy intensive, 20% of cost and highly tradable over three folds um, uh, over 75%. Um, so this is the US, but okay, we can, we can say on, on the, certainly on the horizontal axis, it will be the same and I think on the left as well. So how big is the leakage program? problem. So um, the, the um, idea here is that uh, if you look at the left graph, you see that a lot of the imports that we're getting, imports we're getting are increasingly uh, intensive in CO2, suggesting there's a lot of leakage, whereas what we produce inside, the blue line is actually going down. But the literature that has taken place on these questions doesn't seem to have very massive leakage levels. Uh, neither at firm level, not uh, by delocalization of multinationals, not on sectoral studies. Um, the thing is, part of the reason, as I will show you, is we have a system to prevent leakage, okay? And both factors that were preventing leakage are going to go away. One was that low, the carbon price was very low. Remember, I showed you here, we were desperate just a few years ago, seeing that it was impossible to get carbon price to go up. That's why the market stability reserve. And the second reason is what is called the free allowance. The free allowance is you're going to get a free allocation of permits simply because you are existing. You just get some permits for free. You can pollute some. How much can you pollute? The same as the 90% as the top 10% performers. The 90% of the top 10% performers you can produce. So find the top 10% uh, 10, 10 performers. Notice. The curve is very flat, so among the top 10 performers is a lot of people. And then the, the free allowances are going to be 90% uh, of, 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 that, of, those, of, that, of that production. So what it means is that um, there is a lot of free allowances that prevent um, leakage. So uh, what is the aim that we are seeking with the legislation uh, for CBAM? Okay, we want to prevent leakage. That would be the idea. But of course, there's many other agendas, okay? I told you politically, this is, people like it, even people who don't like the climate at all, okay? So you have to be wary when you are kind of looking at the legislation and when you're looking at what people vote, are they really trying to do something environmental or are they doing something else? And that could be avoiding loss of competitiveness. We want to, for sure to be WTO compatible. Morten talked about that, I'll talk a little bit about that. We want to minimize the implementation difficulties and we want to try to push other countries to induce carbon. But we also want, I mean, as you see this competitiveness, we also want potentially to, to help local industry, and that's, that's a place where you have to watch it. Now, as Morten said, um, there was a lot of discussion about export rebates. My personal opinion, and it will potentially uh, provoke disagreement among you, is that this was not a bad idea. I thought it was politically a good thing to pass it. And second, you have somebody here who's producing some aluminum and they're going to have to pay ATS, then they have to export it somewhere else, and you're going to be lose competitiveness. Of course, the problem is then people could keep dirty plants inside the EU for export. So at the end, we decided not to put the export rebate. So they are not there. So the primary aim should be environmental. So how do you do a primary aim, aim, aim environmental? You try to mirror, and some of the things that Morton was like, hey, these are going to be tricky implementation-wise, etc., are part of this aim, like, uh, in order to avoid people paying twice, you can surrender your own ETS that you paid in China or in Seattle or in, sorry, or in San Francisco and get back your carbon price. Um, you can demonstrate your level. If you actually are very clean, you can show people, look, I am very clean, so I don't have to pay these default values. It makes it a little bit more complicated, but it actually ensures that this is a, a, a system that provides the right incentives. There were three things on the table when we start and started. One was an excise duty tax on consumption. Immediately it's clear that this is not going to really give you what, what you want in terms of, 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 of uh, targeting the, the, the value changes in the, in the same way, and et cetera. There was a possibility of a tax. Um, 
WTO, it looked like a duty. It was not clear that it was compatible. It could be perceived as protectionist. It's not going to be moving with ATS. The ATS was clearly the right way. So let's do a, a mechanism that just mirrors the ATS, which means people are going to automatically adjust. The price is going to adjust up or down to what people inside are paying. It's going to be symmetric. There's not going to be an undue burden. And this is very important. I told you this before. It's easier to approve. We don't need unanimity. You cannot. You don't have to convince Hungary to do this. Okay. This is crucial in Brussels. Okay. Because everything that is unanimity, you have one country. You see what happens now with Hungary and uh, the aid to Ukraine. They're holding up all the aid to Ukraine because they don't get back their money for the European uh, Reconstruction Fund. So every time you do unanimity, you have that type of problem. So that was that was the agreement. A big part of the agreement. It's, it's interesting. I don't know if it was boundary rationality or or if it's interest. But the place where everybody got really, really intense was the transition period. When are we going to withdraw the free allowance? Of course, the industry wants to say, oh, we get the ATS and we keep the free allowances, okay, the CBAM. So we still can pollute for free, and on top of that, we're getting uh, uh, other people to have to pay. So we get double protection. Um, this was kind of a no-go for the Greens and for us, for the Liberals, uh, absolutely no, no way. So all the votes and all the difficulty, we went to a vote, we have to withdraw the legislation, do it again because people changed. Basically what happens, parenthesis on the interesting political economy here and the way the politics works, is that the people in the committee cannot have all these packs and they all agree on something. When you go to the plenary, you have a lot of MEPs who have never heard of CBAM who get a call from the um, Asturias steel plant, north of Spain, who are like, oh, we're gonna have to close, this is terrible, and they don't really have the time to look it up. So suddenly, in the last minute, you lose lots of votes that you didn't even know were at play. People who have never raised a hand in any meeting, have never said, we worry about CBAM, suddenly they're like, oh my God, this is the worst thing, we're going to lose all the jobs. And five minutes before the vote, and you're like, okay, what's gonna happen? So we lost the vote, we had to pull it, and we did it again. The final result, I think, is not bad. It was a compromise, but it was moved forward, but the phasing out of the free allowances happens exactly simultaneously with the CBAM phased in. So I think that's all right. 2034, for me, whether it was 32, 34, I don't think that's a big deal. The big deal is that we have a good system. And I think it's not a bad system. Um, a big part is the scope. Are you going to put lots of products, all the products inside ETS? Are you going to go vertically or horizontal? Your room full of economists, I have to explain you that if you just charge a little bit, then substitution happens all over the place. Vertically, okay, you would start making cars with aluminum that's made somewhere else because the aluminum pays, but the car is doesn't. So you make the car somewhere else, that's a disaster. Horizontally, instead of using aluminum, you use, uh, or cement, you use, uh, uh, I don't know, granite or something that is not taxed. So substitution is a big problem. So I ideally, as an economist, would like to have a broad system, flat, equal for indirect and for direct, etc. That's very, very, very hard. So this is the final legislation. It doesn't go as far. It's cement, iron, steel, aluminum, fertilizers, electricity, and hydrogen. Those are the things. What happens with indirect and direct emissions? The indirect scope is in orange. These are things that are included. When you look at scope one, that's direct emissions. That's emission that the process of producing the steel generates. Easy. Two is indirect emissions, which are electricity. What is the electricity that the product, the product generates? Three is the input materials. You see that uh, the upstream is included, not the raw materials in transportation distribution, but yes, the other ones. Downstream is not. So uh, the steel, the car is not paying, okay? So you can see the problem there. Um, I can make a car uh, somewhere else and the steel and the aluminum in the car won't pay. That's a problem for you. Um, it will be expanded uh, as we do the, the, the phase one, as we finish, we might expand it to the other ETS sectors and hopefully to the scope three to the other segments of supply chain. This is a tricky thing, okay? This is a tricky thing. Um, how are we going to assess it? And this is something that Mert Morton was, was very much uh, emphasizing. Um, uh, how am I doing? Am I okay with time? Maybe two minutes. Two minutes. Is that good? Yeah, I maybe, yes, I maybe a, a four if possible. So, so the assessment method, there is a trade-off between uh, accuracy and feasibility. Um, you, you want to be as close as possible to true emissions, but think of the following thing. What are the incentives for true disclosure? Very clear. Are we going to use the plant of export origin? Because what they could do is resuffle, like, like Morton was saying, I produce in this dirty plant here for export and in this uh, uh, clean plant for, sorry, they were on clean for export, dirty for import. But I could also do 
use nuclear, plug into nuclear the plant that is uh, for export and use coal for the other plant and the implementation costs. So the alternative would be let's use default values all around and that's it. We're not going that way. We, use, we do have the average intensity of exporting country as a possibility, but, but we are going for the individual value. The process is going to be define the boundary, identify the parameters, attribute emissions. It's pretty tricky, right? Um, and then determine the specific emissions. I'm not going to go to the process. Just to tell you, for example, these define the system boundaries. These are all the things that you're including. This is producing steel. This is a slide from the European Commission from last month in China. They went to China and they had a 17 hour workshop explaining to all the exporters how they were going to have to fill in this paperwork. So this is tricky. Um, they're going to have to submit information on the goods, on the installation, the production, the emissions, etc. Right now without verifiers, okay? We don't have verifiers right now. They just have to start doing paperwork. How do you calculate the emissions? You have a measurement based method. You put a little machine that uh, monitors uh, by, uh, by several electronic ways, or you have a calculation based method. What is a calculation based method? There's basically two ideas. One is what is called the standard method. Sum overall inputs I of the factor intensity of the inputs times the carbon intensity of that input. How much factor do I use? How much carbon, okay? And add the electricity and all the other fuels. That's one possibility. It's a good approximation. Uh, it needs to calculate the import, the, the emission factors which have to be calculated by the producer. Now, the electricity is the trickiest part, as I told you. How do you avoid shuffling? That I plug, that I say, oh, I use this, I use nuclear for this production. Well, the way we do that is we're going to use default values for energy, for energy um, an average emission factor for the, for the country, unless it's plugged in. Okay, if you have a nuclear plant that is plugged into your steel plant, then that's okay. That's like truly you're doing it greener now, or a hydro plant. Now, uh, power purchase agreements, you can already see that's kind of a, a lot is going to fall under that, I can imagine. Um, the other method is the mass balance method. You calculate um, the mass and the in intensity produced. That's the carbon produced. You pr calculate the um, uh, inputs and the difference is what you have emitted. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk briefly is the WTO compatibility. We worked very hard, as Martin said, in the parliament. In the, I mean, really, really hard. Everybody wanted this to be WTO compatible. The reason I believe it's WTO compatible is there is absolutely no discrimination between national and foreigners. They pay the exact same. They pay the ETS. If they have already paid ETS, they can surrender the permits. So there is no discrimination. And in terms of most favored nation, it's also the case that every country is going to face the same deal. So we're not discriminating among countries. So in my view, this is WTO compatible. And anyway, we could always say, yes, we are WTO compatible because it's green, and green is always compatible. I have to jump that quickly. Ideally, we would want to recruit to, to get zero money from that. If we could, our idea is that there is zero uh, taxation coming from, it, from CBAM. Why? Because countries, as indeed um, Nordhaus put it, well, they see that they're going to have to do it. They might as well pay it themselves. So in Turkey, uh, carbon tax, you nudged Turkey towards Paris Climate Accord. In uh, South Korea, they note the Korean Mission Trading Scheme covers a range of sectors because of CBAM. So Cur Turkey and Korea have actually done what we would want them to do, which is they price carbon because they don't want to have to pay. I mean, they might as well get their own money. Why are they going to give us the money, right? So it makes a lot of sense, and that's ideally what we want. The problem is twofold, and I will finish with this. One. We have a completely different approach in the US and the EU. We are going for taxing, for imp imposing higher costs. We are very ambitious, but we're imposing costs. The US is reducing the cost of doing nice things. We're uh, taxing the doing bad things, they're reducing the cost of doing good things. The result still is going to cost half as much to produce in the US as in Germany in, uh, by the end of the decade. That is a catastrophe for Europe. That is a very big problem. It's going to generate a lot of tension. Second thing that worries me, uh, and I think uh, uh, Morten had the same data in a different cut, um, this is the current, the most, the latest World Bank uh, analysis. They have a very nice analysis by product and by country of how much they're going to be affected by CBAM. This is the average exposure. You see countries in Africa in red, including South Africa. You see Russia, obviously, in red. You see many countries in red that are going to have very high exposure. 
And this is to, to, for them, particularly in South Africa, for example, this might be a non-trade buyer. They might prefer not to export and to do the paperwork. And that's not what we would want. Um, so I think the design is quite good. Um, it's going to probably expand, but uh, it has uh, international dimension that is, to me, the most complicated. Thank you. The, the book is international. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I see the time. Great. So now we have about uh, half an hour uh, to discuss uh, with Morten and Luis with more details some of these aspects. And also, I encourage you to ask questions. Maybe first I'll throw a couple and then we can open it. So one <coughs> was on the WTO compliance. Obviously, the phase out of EU emissions was extremely important, the, the yep. allowances, <laughs> because otherwise, clearly, mm. it would be twice. <laughs> yeah. not, not WTO compliant. The US, I wanted to <laughs> talk about that and the US perspective. My sense is that this CVAM, and let's see what you think, but my sense is that this CVAM makes such good economic sense that the US tested, it, tested its waters to see how much they could backlash against it and kill it, but they realized that they were out of economic arguments. So Luis and I were at a conference with some lawyers, some DC people, and they were trying to come up with arguments that this CBAM was autarkic and whatever, but honestly, they came out empty after that conference. So my perception is that they might, maybe would have liked to kill it, but it's such a strong case that, that it's just not an autarkic measure. It's making prices higher of things that we should consume less. Um, that at the end they kind of run out of arguments. So, so what do you think about that? I, I, I agree that's what happened in the conference, but I <laughs> wish they were so enlightened. If you look at my gray map, which is no longer there, but if you look at my gray, my, my map uh, trade implementation risk, the US is in gray. So they have zero. It's not a coincidence the six sectors we chose don't have US exports. So basically, they are not exporting to the EU uh, cement, iron steel, cement comes from Mexico, iron steel, aluminum, fertilizers, electricity, and hydrogen. So, um, I wonder what's going to happen when you start expanding towards things in which they are more intensive. I mean, I wonder what would have happened if cars had fallen uh, indirectly under the, the thing. So, so so maybe the exception, I guess, yes, electricity would only be counted if it's one of these six sectors, yes. right? Mm -hmm. yeah. so, uh, so that's why, uh, because we are indirectly importing electricity gas. from the US. Yes. Uh, we are importing gas, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. They, they are not really affected with no, exactly. No, no, no. I so, so I was uh, yes. Uh, so I was going to ask a follow up on so, so so for instance the cars. So now we have these uh, six six industries uh, where we don't really import much from from the United States, and we have this very detailed thing in which we try to figure out what are the emissions from a particular producers. Was there any discussion of saying okay, here's a broader set of industries, they're just going to have default values. So like cars, there's just going to be a default value based on say whether the car is aluminum or what, or how heavy it is, or something like very basic that's very easy to check when it comes in. So I think there were two arguments against expanding the scope. One was the actual uh, implementation costs, how we're going to kind of monitor, have certificates, etc. But the other one, to be honest, I mean, I had car as one of my, in, in the first presentation I gave in Parliament on this, uh, I had the car as an uh, exact example. In fact, it has been in these slides at some point. Um, so, so basically, you decompose the car, you see how much aluminum, how much steel it has, and you. But um, I think the mix of implementation and here of the U.S. has kind of restricted the scope. So one one thing that I have been wondering for those type of products is that uh, it might be another justification for more than your kind of second, third best policy of taxing them less rather mm -hmm. than more. Because one concern is that if you put a default content for a good, and the import, the exporter uh, that we are importing can show that they are actually cleaner, they might then say this is not compatible with WTO because they are kind of taxed heavily. Yeah, so that's maybe another argument for taxing them a little bit. And in my view, nowadays, I'm just so desperate after doing so little with climate policy. Yeah, better than nothing, right? It's better than nothing, right? it's better exactly. than nothing, better than nothing. I know it's kind yeah, of a sad yeah. state of affairs, but it's kind of better yeah. than, than nothing. <laughs> yes, Beatrice. Yeah. Thank you very much for this uh, great discussion, Desidon. Yeah. Um, 
I, uh, and, and you know, as Ma was saying at the beginning, uh, it, it is actually incredible that we have a CBAM. Um, and uh, having recently traveled a bit with a uh, Chinese delegation to COP, um, my impression was that, uh, I mean, they're talking a lot about CBAM and they are talking about the fact that their carbon tax is too low and that they need to uh, increase it. So a very, very positive uh, type of uh, uh, discourse uh, from the biggest polluter in the world, right? So that's where the, the gigatons are. Uh, but my question is, is more towards the US, given that um, we are not gonna change these different approaches. I mean, the US is very unlikely to move to uh, actually taxing carbon and is uh, more likely to in uh, increase subsidies. Is there no way that we can somehow make these two systems compatible by the greenness of the product that arrives on the border? Because at the end of the day, that's what we care about, how many emissions are in the product. And we have increasingly good uh, yeah. data on what is the carbon footprint of a product. Go first. No, no, no like my view is that they are they are lacking uh, being lucid, so they just don't see the problem. Uh, they just don't think transparently about it. The problem with uh, subsidies is that then you are um, um, you are making it very cheap to be produced. So yes, it's green, but you are first encouraging consumption, but then you're also making it very anti-competitive for the other firms that are paying their taxes. So the problem is that in the US, the discussion is so far from where it should be that even good friends of mine that I consider very intelligent end up justifying these type of policies. <laughs> so I was talking to a friend of mine who was at the Treasury at the time, and, and she was so excited that they could justify that they don't have to pay a CBAM because they are subsidizing, <laughs> and, and she's a good economist, she's an intelligent economist, but still, when you get into the politics, it's so far from where it should be that you end up convincing yourselves that, that it might be a good thing. To be fair, at that conference, part of the big thing of the conference was to discuss a carbon border mechanism for methane in natural gas which sounds great because you might think, wow, this is one of the largest sources of uh, global warming. But it's just about the methane that escapes in the process of using gas, not about the actual warming content of gas, which is orders of magnitude higher. Now, the US, of, as a producer, wanted to look good about it because they would be taxing themselves. But guess what? Some other maybe less fancy countries have higher leaks. So it's not even that big of a deal for them to tax their methane and the price impact compared to the, propia, the, proper, the proper social cost of carbon is ridiculously small. So, so they are kind of padding themselves with policies that are either small or make no economic sense, but they kind of get excited about them because honestly, if you get into the politics, that's the space and the space is kind of quite tragic there. So, so uh, a, a couple of a couple of comments. One, one uh, in the in the spirit of of, uh, of disagreement in the panel, let me defend uh, the, the methane uh, the methane proposal. Um, so, so um, no, I'm not saying it's bad, but it's it's, it's really it's small. small. Yeah. Yes. So our view. I was I was working with with Kathleen uh, uh, Wolfram and, and Kimberly Clausen on, on the methane on the methane thing. You can see it in the uh, Peterson Institute uh, website. And our view was like. Okay, or at least I was persuaded of the view that it's better to start the U.S. down the path of totally. pricing. Yes. So even if it's, of course, it's not a coincidence that this is the area where it favors them more and where they anyway have a charge. But uh, let me let me think a little bit out loud about about Bea's suggestion. So um, I I agree very much with Ma that what is what has been happening is that the U.S. political constraints have been dictating a path which is way suboptimal. Right in the 90s. ETS carbon pricing was suggested by uh, the Enterprise Institute and the right wing and everything. So it was supposed to be the free market way and then it was defended by Democrats and now it doesn't seem to be defended by anybody. Um, the administration wanted carbon pricing but there was this fellow, this senator from a coal state, West Virginia, Cole Manchin, whose vote was crucial and you needed a West Virginia vote 
and you needed to do something that West Virginia would like. So you couldn't tax coal, so then you start subsidizing everything, including uh, coal jobs to help with the transition. That's, that was just the politics, right? So the question is, how are we going to react? So I agree with Mar that this is way suboptimal, especially from the trade perspective, also overconsumption and, and many other things. I understand the US economists are like, okay, this is the first legislation we pass for climate. Everything else that has happened in climate in the US has been regulatory action by the agencies, uh, not actual law. And so they're like, okay, we should be encouraged and we should be helped. But the problem is that in, in your scenario, if we credit them for sending green stuff, which has been, uh, with, has been subsidized, then we're, we're kind of creating them twice. I mean, in some sense, we are kind of killing our own industry, right? Because we are saying you already have passed this filter when in fact you've passed the filter by being subsidized. So I think politically, what, what is nice about CBAM and what is nice about ETS is you tell me how much coal you, uh, CO2 you produce, I tell you how much you pay, end of discussion. So they would pay little, they would have a low ETS factor under the way we're doing, we, they would have to buy a few alliances if they are green. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't say you don't have to buy any allowance because we consider your subsidy equivalent to an allowance. That seems like, I mean, shooting ourselves in the foot. The way they're going to benefit is if they have really greened, they're going to have to surrender few allowances because they don't emit a lot of tons of CO2. That is already benefiting us. That's what I would say. I don't know if that points out the journey. Um, yes, but I think, so I think I'm a little bit more glass half full on this and sort of the, so it's clearly suboptimal, yes, but it's much better than we would have expected four years ago. And if you talk to Catherine, I mean, like she's also, uh, Wolfram again, the, the person we've mentioned a couple of times, she's also more positive on the path that the US is moving right now. It's clearly not ideal, but at least it's better than what we had before. But in the sort of future versions of this, we've talked about how the current CFAM is sort of almost assigned to the industries that the US doesn't export to the EU in. Uh, you don't see this being ex expanded to other industries, say the car industry in like four years? I, I, I mean, I had, I had a third slide where there were... You, there you were know, you know, we can't see that, right? No, uh, you yeah, can't yeah. see it because it's there. Yeah. So um, the, the um, um, idea is that... Uh, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll find it, hold on. Um, it's very much at the end. So this idea that it will be expanded um, so maybe this is a commission slide, so this is official. Um, so we're going to uh, potentially extend uh, other raw materials. Uh, you see petroleum chemicals. Chemicals, of course, the U.S. exports a lot. Uh, so some of those other things. Um, other indirect emissions, that's not even considered right now. So I would say there are sectors, primary sectors being considered or... Uh, kind of modify raw materials, but not consumption goods. I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon, or at least I don't see it. But of course, in these three years, we might have a lot of backlash, and we might have a lot of re-discussion. There's not going to be a new commission. Who knows how the parliament comes out in the vote uh, in, in May, and there's going to be a new parliament. Uh, who knows if if, if it wants to, to re retake this legislation. And I, I do think it's important that this gets off the ground, right? So we all agree exactly. that, it, that it's kind of incredible that this even happened. Exactly. So like, let's make sure it starts in a couple of years, there's actually taxation and so on. Once that sort of has been established as a thing we're doing, then I would like to see uh, other things being included, including those from the US. Yes. So, the so there you see consumption, transportation, end of life. I mean, you see yes. all these other emissions yeah. which are So, so the, the so truth is that many of those sectors with the UEDS2 are already covered. So Inside. when we think about petroleum, fossil fuel extraction, yes. it's more about the methane leaks and the emissions yes. at production. There are some emissions to petroleum production. I don't worry that much about that. I worry about burning oil and yes. burning gas. And with the UETS too, almost all oil and gas that is burned in the EU yes. will be covered. So one of the big, big, big sectors, I think, in that outdated graph with the Russia imports, a big part of that is natural gas and oil. And that's now uh, de facto covered, except that we are not covering the fact that Russia emits some emissions while producing the oil. 
it, it is maybe five to ten percent of emissions, yeah, but, it's, it's, but it's at also least not nothing, right? If you emit it to leakage, then it's methane going into the air. Whereas if you burn it cleanly, then it's less polluting. It's not nothing, but but but, but I mean like but yes. at least we are taxing maybe ninety percent of its contribution to global warming, and that's uh, thanks to the UEDS two rather than the CVAM because it's going at the yeah. consumption point rather than the import point. Yes, yes. So that, that is a sector that's implicitly yes. better covered now. Uh, so that's, that's a good thing. Agreed. Yes. Um, on keeping it not half empty but also half full, I've done some work in California where we looked at the reshuffling issue that you mentioned mm -hmm. with electricity. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm, we had some, honestly, mm, very simple, not not super fancy model of the electricity sector in the Western interconnection, mm -hmm. but it was hourly data, it had transmission constraints, it had many power plants, so fancy enough. And indeed, if we just did a, a model without any regulatory political constraints, what we found is that California, which had a system very similar to Morton, they basically tax imports of electricity at a, at a default rate, but you could show that you were greener by showing you had a PPA or some that sort of a thing. So from a maybe two style life model perspective, we found that there was enough a scope for reshuffling that you could claim everything was zero emissions. Mm -hmm. You could take from, no, even with transmission constraints, you could just pull, pull from Oregon, which has a lot of hydro, you could pull from uh, the Nevada desert, you could pull from everywhere, you could claim everything is green. Mm -hmm. Now. However, you have to make a statement and provide some legal documents that you are actually having some PPA that's, mm -hmm. you know, legit. So our understanding, the regulatory agencies were also very clear that they were not too happy if there would be a lot of kind of, so, so our sense is that empirically, even though in theory you could have basically washed everything out, empirically that the, the utilities, many of which are very regulated utilities, they kind of discipline themselves a little bit. At least this is how we were interpreting I the see. results. That they didn't go full on, even though from a theoretical point of view, it looked to us that there was plenty of a scope to just claim everything, everything was green. So maybe that's kind of a bit of a reassuring, reassuring uh, aspect. It's true that it's a state legislation in a federal country, so, mm, uh, it's not with other countries, so I think uh, it might be a bit different, but that was a bit of a reassuring result that we had there. So, so I wanna open it up to further questions uh, from the audience. Yes, please, Estelle, and then Mirabel. Hi, thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, so I had a, uh, a question about measurement. So you know, we know that the challenge when we expand the scope is going to be measurement, and I was wondering to what extent um, uh, there was some. There, there had been some consideration to the possibility of using satellite data to uh, to because now you can measure the emissions at the installation level. And to what extent? Because right now it's you know declare and verify kind of. And to what extent mm -hmm. there was thought that you know maybe a way uh, going forward would be to use these uh, you know this data generated you know either from input output you know data or just uh, you know satellite data to. Uh, to get the uh, the needed information, so whether that that was part of the debate at the EU level, both. Luis, I think you are. Yes, no, I I I I, uh, I think there is openness on the measurement based methods. I cannot tell you whether satellite. We in the proposal for methane, we have talked about satellite because methane methane uh, leakage can be detected, um, but I I cannot tell you about whether that is going to be the case for 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 CO2. I, I, I don't know if anybody in the audience knows. Maybe Rick knows. I don't know. I don't know. I, don't I, know. I believe it's theoretically possible, but, but with too much noise that it's sort of a feasible thing in, uh, in practice. Yeah, that would be my concern, that it opens up the door to claiming this is yeah. a bogus measurement and way cleaner than you've said, and again, uh, backfire a little bit. Um, so that, that would be my, my concern. But I don't know how good these are. Are they very accurate? These you, they can get very accurate. I see. I mean, that would be a, if that were to work technically in say 2030, that would alleviate quite a bit of my concern with the way that yeah. the system is set up now, right? Mm -hmm. Because I am worried that the EU will have next, you said um, declare and verify. I mean, it's mostly declare and not so much verify, right? Um, so one could imagine several different systems. One could imagine say, 
We have a few third-party verifiers, PricewaterhouseCoopers, some international organization that has, I mean, like has some reputational stake here, maybe some whistleblower yeah. set up, something like that. And then it's costly for them if they are found to have certified a plant in China that then turns out to be much more emitting that they had. I mean, like, I could build a little model where that would work. Whether that's going to work in practice, um, I'm concerned about. Yep. You could imagine something like that, sort of very simple. Uh, not very simple, but, like, you don't have to actually go into the country to verify it like that. I don't know what, what of these things are going to work in practice. But, like, that has to have been... That's the, that, is the, that is the model, the independent verifying. Mm -hmm. That is the model right now. And how we and how are we going to do that? There's going to be a register. You're going to have to get authorized as an independent right. verifier. I mean, it's. I mean, I agree with you that this is a, a work in progress. I mean, how there is an installation in the middle of China, who is going to go there to verify it? And but there's going. You're going to have to surrender your thing signed by independent verifier. So, not quite related to carbon emissions. Um, there is a student at Toulouse who has a paper on. Um, forests and whether forests are sustainably certified mm -hmm. and it's kind of independent certifier that gets some bit of a stick at some point. So you randomly check that they are kind of doing legit legit work. So and maybe um, I don't want to misquote uh, a student's job market paper, so I'm going <laughs> to just leave it at that, just okay. check it out to okay. lose, yes. Very good. Uh, yes. <laughs> But it's very interesting work, and I was very excited also from the CBAM perspective. Yeah, uh, but I don't want to misquote the numbers in the paper, but you should, you should definitely check it out. Uh, Mirabel, you had a question too? Yeah, thank you for really interesting presentations. Um, my question is around methane, because it's been mentioned several times, and I was wondering if there's discussions about uh, giving the potential to offset effort on methane with, uh, against effort on carbon. The reason I'm asking is that I listened to a really interesting professor from Oxford called P uh, Professor Pierre Humbert, who shows that the current um, greenhouse gas potential that's been measured is based on uh, the life um, of 100 years of a gas, but that if you're going to start to, uh, I if you extend that 100 years to 200, 300 years, then carbon and methane uh, um, uh, carbon becomes much more of a problem yes. relative mm -hmm. to methane. And so I was worried hearing uh, whether po in the political sphere there's any discussion of a trade between the two, which would be really wrong from a scientific point of view. There is right now the negotiation in Europe is about an emission uh, verification system for methane to, to ensure that people are tracking, uh, measuring, reporting. There is no right now there was a discussion of sanctions, but uh, the parliament won the sanctions. I don't think that's going to happen as of my last information, which is like a few weeks old. Um, but no, it's separated from the CO2. Uh, it's separated from the CO2 system. Uh, we will see a methane. I hope we will see a methane. Uh, anything that doesn't happen before March will die because there is now the Belgian presidency and there are elections and then we have to restart. My hope is that this emission verification is, is imminent or it was imminent as of very recently. And when it comes to the U.S., I think it's not a trade-off. It's just, okay, CO2 is not going to happen. Can we do something? Yeah. But there's not a real, a real mm -hmm. trade-off because that thing is definitely not happening. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the, the sad state of affairs, yes. Question over here, yes. Yeah, thanks. So, Morton, you mentioned the importance of the incentives uh, for foreign firms to reduce their CO2, which I think is a first order uh, objective here. And that comes from uh, swi switching between the different stages of certification versus non-certification and different taxation rates. But I was missing that a little bit in the further discussions here. So when you are, dis when you are setting the optimal uh, tariff rates in the two stages, is that for which objective are you doing this? Is this for decarbonization or is this for just tax revenues or is this just for clearing the level playing field? Uh, here, so. uh, wonderful, very detailed theoretical question. So I had a little comment about what the optimal policy is. The optimal policy here is for a social planner that aggregates the welfare of the home and the foreign country 
and that welfare function has some cost, some social cost of carbon of total emissions. And the reason why we consider the social welfare of the whole uh, um, world, in this case just these two countries, is partly because we don't want to get confused with, or we don't want to get distracted by uh, terms of trade consideration, which are like they will pop up here and they're sort of well understood what will happen if you tax. So we want to ignore that. And partly because like the EU is at least to some extent claiming that they're doing this because it's a, it's a global externality, we should consider the well-being of everyone and so on. So these are the two reasons why we consider global welfare. If I just consider the um, home welfare, then I actually lose tariff revenues from having an individual basis instead of a, an aggregate one. Because if I just have an aggregate one, I'm gonna tax everyone the same. If I then switch to letting a firm certify, I'm gonna tax them at a lower level because only the cleanest ones will certify, and I'm gonna lose tax revenue uh, from this. It's sort of the theoretical equivalent of what Lewis said just before, of we hope that we're not gonna get any tariff, uh, tariff revenues from this because other countries are gonna are gonna respond to this as well. But, so that's, that's, that's how we set it up. So for the case of the US, for example, for a little moment, they were actually even thinking about putting a carbon border adjustment mechanism for CO2 because they thought they could pull off putting a tax on carbon <laughs> coming into the US justifying it with the subsidies inside. So not only did they want to justify <laughs> not paying the European carbon for the adjustment, they wanted to justify putting one in the US. So for that to be optimal, you start having these very autarkic motives, and obviously it was very attractive to the Republican Party, because it was truly an autarkic tariff that had little to do with the environment. But I do think the EU one is justified on the grounds of global mm -hmm. welfare, as Morton was saying. And I in the spirit and even in its implementation, I think it's quite, uh, we, we can feel proud about something today. So that's good. Yes. Um, so I don't know if there's any other questions uh, over there. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, very clear. Um, my question is, we have the feeling that um, both European producers and third countries producers are complaining and are uh, fearing losing competitiveness. So um, my question is, we who, <laughs> who is really at risk? So maybe I'll take it first, you will know more. But my, my sense is that the, the and you will uh, see if this is true in, in reality. But my perception is that the industrial producers were against CBAM, not because a CBAM is harmful to producers, it's actually protecting them, but because the status quo mm. was subsidies. Yeah, yeah. So if you think about a world with nothing and a world with a carbon tax or a world with a carbon tax and CBAMs, the industrial producers are absolutely happier. But obviously in the legislation process, they tried to kill it because that was not the status quo. The status quo is that they had a subsidy that was keeping the prices for their uh, goods low. This CBAM is not magic. It's making goods more expensive because we think they should be. So obviously for the industrial producers, they are losing something there compared to the status quo. So, so they are right that they are losing something, but it's not because they are facing anti-competitive competition, it's more because now their externality is more properly more properly taxed, which which is a different argument to, to make, but, but it's true that some of these industries might lose a bit of a um, um, size, yes. No, I totally, 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 what you said is completely right, right? It was all about this figure, right? The, 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 the discussion was all about this. Like, okay, am I going to lose my free allowance in getting the CBAM and then I'm going to complain? Of course, foreign producers are saying now we have a, a new tariff and non-tariff barrier. So, so there, there, I mean, I guess producers are always going to complain because they want better treatment and that's kind of just fair enough. I mean, you just have to deal with it and, and not pay excessive attention. And maybe on that note, maybe to conclude, it, it highlights why it's so important that this CBAM was passed. 
So for two years, it's only reporting. For as far as I can say, for the next four, uh, no, maybe next two. So for two years, only reporting. And then for the next uh, four, three, four, almost no bite compared to the free allowances, but it completely changes the status quo. So it makes the status quo a CBAM. Now we can argue how big the CBAM should be, but it's kind of there. A little bit what happened with the UETS. It was there in its trial period. It had zero prices. It's considered um, a huge lack of success for some. I just see it like, look, we tried, it worked, and now we have a price we're putting. Yeah. So I think uh, uh, in that note, it's important to change the status quo, to for change sure. the perspective of the industrial manufacturers. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, we're going to collect revenue from the exporters. I mean, there is going to be the money that comes from the free allowances are no longer free, <laughs> and the money that comes from the uh, from the importers having to surrender allowances. So you you get two sources of revenue in principle. Uh, as always, when there is extra revenue, there is a lot of people claiming that revenue. So in the European Union, some people like me wanted that to go to EU budget because we need money to pay, for example, the debt that we are incurring and to pay all the extra public goods we're trying to get. Some people wanted it to go back to the countries for environmental expenditure and some people wanted to go to uh, the countries that are going to be facing this, South Africa or whatever, to help them cover that. I would think that some help, particularly with non-trade buyers, would be a good thing, but basically the ones who win are the countries which, which are going to receive this. So we'll leave it at that. Uh, uh, thank you so much, and thank you to Luis and Morgan. I believe this was super interesting, at least to me, so thank you for attending. <laughs> yes. Thank you.